Turkish-born Faranisa Zaid is by some considered one of the greatest female artists of the 20th century. Now, some of her rare pieces are on display in Istanbul. The exhibition named Ode to Passion will showcase some of her unique works that have stood the test of time, with others on public display for the first time, thanks to private Turkish collectors. One of the few paintings of this scale that's still uh, in circulation and that remained. Um, she built like amazing paintings, very large scale, and mainly showed them in uh, Paris, in major museums, but we don't really have access to those works. We don't know their condition, where they are exactly, and we think some of the works might have been destroyed after the exhibition. Born into an elite Ottoman family, she was one of the first females to study art in Turkey. But her work was infused with further creativity once she married and had a chance to travel outside of Turkey. Having lived in cities such as London, Paris and Oman, her style was to merge all these experiences and give an insight into the cultures that she lived in. Living abroad also gave the confidence to create an abstract style which became part of her identity. She was known for large-scale abstract paintings, but also for her portraits and later work using chicken bones. Zaid also blended elements of Islamic and Byzantine art with influences from the West, which gave her work a unique identity, similar to her own. She skillfully uh, got into this uh, high culture, high society of these uh, cities, uh, also as an artist. But, and she really fed her intellectual curiosity from the writers and uh, philosophers from these countries, from the artists. Uh, but she, she could manage to bring together everything she learned in Turkey during her education here and in Paris and, through with, and everything she has seen around the world. So she's not really from one unique country. She, I don't think she would identify herself as a Turkish artist. She's from around the world. With her multi-layered images, it is hard to pinpoint exactly what or which cultures or civilizations as she referred to them are intertwined within her work. But for her self-portrait titled Someone from the Past, she expressed how she's a descendant of four civilizations. The hand is Persian, the dress is Byzantine, the face is Cretan, and the eyes Oriental. But something she was not aware of as she was painting it. After her second husband's death, Zaid lived with her son in Amman. There, she founded the Royal National Jordanian Faralnisa Zaid Institute of Fine Arts, where she gave free lectures to female artists. For someone who lived as life as colorful as her work, Zaid's legacy is being protected and just like her, her work is aiming to reach the furthest corners of the globe. Shiraz Ali, TRT World, Istanbul. Joining me now is Adila Laidi Haineya, who is the author of the book titled Fahral Nisa Zaid, Painter of Inner Worlds. She was one of Zaid's students who studied underneath her while she was living in Jordan. Thank you so much for being with us today, Adila. Now, tell me why you decided to write this biography in the first place. Um, I was invited to speak about uh, Fakhr Nisa Zaid three years ago at the Istanbul uh, Biennale. And when I came to do my research, I realized that the only available documentation about her at that time was a collection of old articles from the 40s and the 50s and uh, in a very old fashioned way of looking at her. So I thought there should be a contemporary uh, re-examination of her work for the contemporary reader. But then I forgot about it until or I didn't think I could do it until the, the news came out that there was going to be a large retrospective of her works in London and in Berlin in uh, 2017 and uh, 2018. Uh, so then I uh, put forward a, a project to write her biography and it was easy to find a publisher in London because of the upcoming uh, exhibitions. So. Wow, that's great. I'm really glad that you had the chance to make this happen. Um, now, Fahral Nisa Zaid began teaching women art when she moved to Amman uh, in Jordan, and you actually spent a lot of time with her 
in her studio. How was it being her student? It was fantastic. It was like, uh, when I was her student, she had the, the her main students were adult uh, artists or uh, um, amateur artists mm -hmm. uh, who would meet uh, in the morning in her house or she would meet them uh, privately and teach them. But in my case, I was in school at that time. So I would come in the afternoon once a week. So in a way I was by myself and I had Fakhr Nisa for, for me, for myself. And it was a fantastic experience because to me as a teenager, it was like being in this magical um, cave of this magical fairy who would tell me stories about her life in Istanbul and Paris. And then you have to understand that the way she exhibited her artwork in her home, the pa paintings were, would be close to each other and some of them would be on the ceiling because there would be no space. This is on top of all the antiques. So, and then, of course, engaging with her was just a marvelous, marvelous, unforgettable experience. It sounds absolutely marvelous. Now, Antida, as many of us know, Fahrul Nisa Zaid was the first female artist to, to have a solo exhibition in the very prestigious uh, Institute, of, Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Um, how do you think she was able to break barriers back then, especially when it came to gender equality? Actually, uh, uh, what you just said, this is a discovery of my research because previously people knew that she had exhibited at the ICA, but they would al always say she was one of the first. But I discovered in my research that she was actually the first woman of any nationality. And then it was uh, almost 10 years after Fakhra Nessa that another woman would exhibit. And the ICA at that time was the main venue in London to exhibit contemporary art of, of that time. Uh, and the way it happened, very interestingly enough, the, the way um, she was presented in the documentation, that she was uh, an important representative of the Paris school, which at that time was called Nouvelle École de Paris, because she, you know, her home was in London, but she would spend a lot of time in Paris to exhibit there with her fellow artists. And so for the ICA in London, exhibiting Fakhr Nessa was an opportunity for them to show to the London public the new art coming out of Paris through Fakhr Nessa. So it wasn't just her gender that was an issue back then though as well. It was the fact that she was also Turkish and especially being a Muslim. Okay. Right? This is, the, this is what I found out about how that posed a problem. Her being uh, um, of uh, Muslim origin, uh, Turkish, Iraqi, husband, and a woman. This, you know, this was in the 1950s. This was before globalization, before uh, multiculturalism, before feminism and post-colonialism. So all of the writing about her was very gendered, stereotypical writing about a fantastical woman uh, from the Thousand and One Nights who painted abstract because she, she was forbidden by her religion. Whereas she, she was a modern artist, contemporary artist like all the other modern contemporary artists at that time in London or in, in Paris. Uh, her, she did not paint the desert or the Thousand and One Nights, but this is the way she was put in that box. And this is why I wanted to write this book to uh, reintroduce her to a contemporary readership according to our uh, contemporary um, frames, liberated hopefully from these uh, stereotypes and on her own terms, yes. in her own words. Now, um, you said that she would go from Paris to London and we know that her husband used to be a diplomat and uh, she has said in an interview before that when she was in Paris, she would be an artist and when she would go to London, she'd be a diplomat. How do you think she was able to juggle those responsibilities? Yes, she, this is the, the thing which is remarkable about her. She mixed in her two, she, she mixed and she separated in her two lives. She never pretended to be a poor struggling artist or uh, uh, in, um, in Paris and in London, she did not hide that she was an artist, like it was something maybe mm -hmm. shameful. She, so for example, when she had her exhibition in, in London, she invited ambassadors and ministers and two queens of England visited her exhibition. Wow. Um, and uh, she would, 
Whereas in Paris, everybody knew that she was the wife of, uh, she was a princess and so on. So for her, she told her family that she wanted to gamble on living both lives fully. And actually, when you think about it, it's not both lives, it's three lives. A family life as a wife and mother, as a society hostess from a royal family, and as a, an important, successful contemporary artist. And I th only Fakhr al Nisa could pull it off. Indeed, she's an incredible, incredible woman. We all know that Farho Nisa traveled a lot when, throughout her career, and especially she started traveling at a very young age. How can we uh, trace her travels throughout her paintings? Well, um, her travels, or rather her internal impressions of her travels, can be tracked in all of her artwork. Um, but the, the most important travel-related event in her career is when she uh, changed from a figurative painter to an abstract painter. And this was uh, after she flew for the first time in an airplane in a transatlantic flight in 1949. She flew to go from London to go to New York. It was a very long flight, transatlantic, and she had... Uh, a sh she had a shock, she had a visual shock and an emotional shock to see the, the, the land and the terrains and the houses become very, very small, very suddenly. And this was a visual, she was a very visual person. So this was a visual shock for her. And so she decided to record that on her painting. And then she started painting this type of vision from the air for, let's say about 10, nine years. She seems like a person that makes use of the moment she's in. Um, tell me about the story of how her life drastically changed after uh, her husband kind of stepped out of politics uh, and she had to start cooking. I'm going to yes. leave that there and you take it from there. Yes, she went from having a staff of uh, a house uh, with a staff of 14, full-time staff of 14, to uh, living in a very small dark apartment in London, of course, and she had to, without a cook and so on. So around the end of the new year, she wanted to cook a, um, a new year meal for her husband with a turkey. So she cooked it herself. She learned to cook uh, in 1958, December 1958. And then um, after the meal, she had to dispose of the, of the bones, of the turkey bones. And by that time, because of the tragedy, she had decided not to stop being an artist and to just take care of her husband. But because she was an artist, she couldn't help disposing the, the bones in, a, in an artistic way. And then she became, she started to paint them. And that uh, triggered a chain of events uh, that led her to create a new art form in her practice uh, based on um, animal bones, poultry bones, rabbit bones, uh, to, to make a whole line of uh, artworks in the 60s uh, based on this accident that happened in her kitchen. Now, Adila, um, Fahrul Nisa Zaid is known today mainly for her abstract paintings uh, and for her haunting portraits. Um, tell me a story behind one of her artworks that stand out to you. Yes. Um, Fahrul Nisa, even though she perceived the painting as a, as a, a spiritual endeavor. And even though also she was extremely well-read and uh, cultivated and very intellectual, very often for her paintings, even the most forbidding and the largest ones and the abstract ones, there would always be a funny story or a whimsy anecdote about how it happened. There are, there are two paintings that I can think about. One of them is actually here in, in Istanbul. And I think the story is very famous and it's actually tragic. It's the painting My Hell, Jehennemim, which is at the Istanbul Modern. This is a very large painting. And uh, uh, Fakhr Nisa had been nursing uh, the queen of uh, Iraq, Queen Alia, who was dying of cancer in a London hospital, and she took care of her. She was very affected by her death. And uh, when she died, she went back to her studio to paint for the first time in many months. She had a very large canvas, I think six meters, um, empty. And she writes in her diaries that I was fortunate to read that she didn't know how to paint. And she was sitting there staring at the blank canvas, no idea what to do, and look at, uh, looking at it. And then out of the blue, a fly came 
the fly came on the canvas and the fly started, you know, darting from one end to the other, darting. And she was mesmerized by the fly and she was following it. Then the fly flew, of course. So Fakhra Nisa got up and with a pencil, with a charcoal, she started retracing the path of the fly on the canvas. And she said that in half an hour, she had completed the painting with the charcoal. Of course, afterwards, when she filled it with the colors that we see at the museum, they are very dark colors having to do with the progression of cancer that ultimately killed the queen um, and the feelings that that inspired in Fakhr Nisa. So this was an expression of her grief. But the beginning was by a very humble uh, fly. Yes. All right, Adila, unfortunately, I'm going to have to end that there. But thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today and sharing us your experiences that you had with Fahra Nisa Zaid. Thank you.